because we have gone through the book of Daniel, and we just finished the book of Revelation, the Holy Spirit has set on my heart a teaching that is fairly new to me, that I think you are going to find very, very interesting. And because we've gone through these last two books, Daniel and Revelation, I believe that you guys are ready to go deeper into some deep things. And this teaching, I call it the Genesis 6 Conspiracy, because it stems from chapter 6 in the book of Genesis. But it will go through the entire Bible before we're done. And in this teaching, you are going to understand so many things that have not been clear in the Bible before to most Christians. I think it's a very interesting teaching. I think it's very important for the day and age that we are living in. And it fits perfectly into Bible prophecy. Okay? What would you do if you discovered the end times and the Antichrist were somehow interconnected with giants? With modern conspiracy theories, aliens, vampires, and secret societies? What would you do if you learned the Bible records a dire warning from another apocalypse of an ongoing conspiracy to a specific generation, our generation? Would you simply walk away from such revelations? Seriously, would you really even tell anyone? This teaching is an unsettling quest of chapter 6 of the book of Genesis. It will teleport you to an unfamiliar place, snarred somewhere between faith and reason. This study will challenge your perceptions of what you thought the Bible said, as well as transform your current view of the world as directed by modern secularism. In other words, other than the truth of the Word of God directed by the Holy Spirit, nothing in this world is what it appears to be. Pretty powerful stuff. Pretty powerful stuff. In this spirit, then, the Bible ought to be viewed as a reliable and accurate believer's history, but not as a document designed to meet current secular standards for history or archaeological research. Down through history, God has revealed truth about his word that proves the current popular secularists wrong. Scripture was written to nourish faith, not reason. Hmm. Okay, let me say that again. Scripture was written to nourish our faith, not our reason. It is through this lens we must read it, just as it was written, in a literal sense to faithful believers, and not through the eyes of godless secular cynics, or interpretive mystic revolutionists. Our generation could not possibly be more blinded to the truth or unprepared for what is about to take place. Spiritual blindness is not a coincidence. It is all part of the warning. The prophetic signature for this terminal generation that we live in, that Jesus warned about that would parallel the days of Noah, which is in Matthew 24, 36, and 39. We won't read that, but what he told his disciples there is that with, right before he comes back, mm -hmm. in the days before he comes back, mm -hmm. it's going to be like the days of Noah. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that everybody's going to be partying and having a great time and sin's going to be rampant. That's not what he's talking about, because that's always been true. Right. That is not a sign of his coming back. Right. The sign is that people are not going to believe. Right. The judgment is coming, and they're not going to believe it, much less be prepared for it. <laughs> Revelation is to be served for believers who steadfastly study the Bible. If you are interested in end times, if you are interested in this generation, that is the last generation before Jesus comes back, you need to study your Bible. Mm -hmm. Or you are not going to be 
part of the wise mm -hmm. that the angel told the prophet Daniel. You are not going to be wise in these things. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Mm. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This scripture has been a controversy for theologians, people that have studied this, people that have read about it, all through history. And there are many theories of what it's really talking about here. And, and, the, and the main thing that people get tripped up on is sons of God. Who are the sons of God? In the Hebrew, it is Benai Halloween is the Jewish word. And it means fallen angels or watchers. Okay? In Job 1 through 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Hmm. This is another reference to this sons of God. Because many commentators have tried to place these sons of God as humans. They have tried to place them as probably the descendants of Cain. Hmm. Because Cain was evil and his family after him, people that came after him, his descendants, were evil. And so they try to put this in with him. But it's very clear here, it is not humans. It is fallen angels. We are talking about those one-third of heaven that rebelled with Satan, with Lucifer, and got kicked out of heaven. Now, they got kicked out of heaven, but they still have access to heaven, as we see in Job, okay? But this isn't men coming before God in heaven, hmm. in Job. It is fallen angels. These fallen angels took for them wives. In other words, fallen angels had sex with earthly women. Oh, no. Can I really say that? Yeah. Can I really say that? Yeah. That fallen angels had sex with earthly women? That's why we don't teach this on Sunday morning, <laughs> okay? The New Testament places this account in sequence with other Genesis accounts and identifies it as fallen angels dwelling with humans. It's in 1 Peter 3.19, 2 Peter 2, 4 and 5, and in Jude 6. I won't go into those verses right now. But we know a little bit about angels but we don't know a whole lot. We only know what the scripture tells us, and it's not a lot. In Matthew 22, verse 30, the Pharisees are after Jesus again, okay? They're trying to trip him up. Here Jesus was exposing a false belief of the Sadducees because they did not believe in angels. Angels are a deathless creatures who do not propagate 
and therefore have no need for marriage among themselves. In the resurrection, the saints will have those same characteristics. This does not negate the possibility that angels are capable of procreation, hmm. but only that they do not marry each other. In this verse, Jesus is telling them about the angels, and he said, in the last days, when we become like him, we're going to be like the angels who don't need to reproduce themselves. Mm -hmm. That's all he's saying. Angels don't need to do it. He didn't say that they can't do it. He just says they don't need to. Mm -hmm. They had, mm -hmm. angels have bodies and can look like men. Mm -hmm. There are many instances in the scriptures where we see this happen. Mm -hmm. When the three men come to Abraham, to tell him that he's going to have a son. Mm. We know one of them is Jesus, right. but the other two were angels. Right. But they all appeared to Abraham as men. Mm -hmm. And he invites them into the tent, and they have a meal, mm -hmm. and they're talking, and other people are there. They see him, they go, oh, there's three guys that are visiting Abraham. Mm -hmm. They, the two of them, were angels that looked like men. Right. When the two men come to see Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, mm -hmm. we know that they are angels, mm -hmm. but they look like men. They are so good-looking men that all of the homosexuals in the whole town want to have sex with them, mm -hmm. okay? So we know that angels can appear like men. So can angels have sex with humans? The Bible answers this question quite simply. Genesis 6 is very clear that fallen angels are capable of shape-shifting into human males in the physical realm and that they can produce offspring. Now this is terribly important in this Genesis 6 in what we're going to be studying because we need to understand that this is reality. It really can happen, okay? If you know the word encumbus, the Webster's definition is an evil spirit that has sexual intercourse with a woman, okay? Read as well what Paul taught the first Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 11, verses 1 through 7. Let's turn there. 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 1, we're going to read through 7. 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 1. Initiate me just as I also initiate Christ. Im imitate me, excuse me. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the tra traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. Hmm. The head of the woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is the one and the same of her head for shade. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. For this reason the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. The head covering referred to here is not just a hat but it's a veil. The tradition stems from the days of Noah, when the sons of God saw how beautiful women were, their faces. Thus the tradition that women wear a veil until they are married, when the groom remo removes the veil, symbolizing he is her covering now. Most people don't understand why that is done in a wedding. Paul then goes on in verses 8 and 10, for man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for woman, but the woman for the man. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. What angels? <laughs> the fallen angels. 
okay, Paul is referring to what we're talking about here. The symbol of the covering is that the man is head over the woman, just as Christ is head over the man. Paul is giving the line of authority. Christ is first, man is second, woman is third. That's the line of authority. The point Paul is stressing here is what, and what is important for us in this study, is that without the seal of authority, human women are fair game for fallen angels. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. All down through history, from Babylon to Rome until today, a sign of a prostitute or a feminist is a shaved head. We see that in our society today. Symbolizing that she refuses to submit to God's sequence of authority. That's why these feminists shave their heads. Okay? When we understand how important this is, things start making sense. And as we go through this study, so many things are going to start falling into place, and we're going to start understanding them. Now back to Genesis 6, okay? Turn back there. The giants were the offspring of the fallen angels and human women. They were called giants. The Hebrew name is Nephilim. Understand this word Nephilim because it's going to be so important as we continue on through the Bible. Most people want to just stop here in Genesis 6 and say, okay, all right, fallen angels came down, they had sex with human women, and they produced giants, okay? And so that happened way back then, okay? And that was the only time. Giants, the Hebrew for Nephilim. Nephilim are the offspring of the union between fallen angels and human women. Nephilim were fearful looking giants, as we will see examples later in Scripture with Goliath of the Philistines and King Og of the Amorites. Okay? Whenever you see the word giants in Scripture, it's talking about Nephilim. It's not just some jolly green guy that grew really big. <laughs> Every reference to giants for the rest of the scripture means he was a Nephilim, means that he is half fallen angel and half human woman. That is his DNA. Okay? Goliath was a Nephilim. We will see that later. No, Nephilim mirrored their fathers, the fallen angels. For watchers possess a face of a viper, serpents identified as Sephirim. Satan took the form of Sephirim when he deceived Eve in the garden. A very good video, if you want to go even deeper into this, is Trey Smith's video on Noah. I recommend it. Tradition records that Sephirim possessed faces that were long and narrow, elongated jawbones, thin lips, and slanted eyes. Kind of similar to the pictures of aliens that we see today. Mm -hmm. We're going to get into that. A good reference for that is the book Ashes of Angels, which quotes Dead Sea Scroll, Scroll scriptures that talks about these Nephilim and how they looked. Nephilim are recorded in many Old Testament books, including Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, Ecclesiastes, 1 Chronicles, and in the Psalms. Nephilim are crucial to understanding the Antichrist prophecies and the last days. That's why I'm presenting it to you guys. This is very important when we get to the end, into Revelation, all about the Nephilim. Why is this all so important? I mean, does anybody really care? Does it really matter? How many of you ever seen the movie Inherit the Wind? Have you ever, I didn't think so. It's an old movie. <laughs> Inherit the Wind is about a real thing that happened in the United States back in 1925. It was called the Scopes Monkey Trial. And this trial was bigger than the O.J. Simpson trial. It, in the movie, it stars Spencer Tracy as a lawyer, Henry Drummond, who is sent by the owner of the Baltimore Herald newspaper to defend a teacher named John Scopes
for teaching the theory of Darwinism in a public school contrary to Tennessee law. Mm -hmm. The state is represented by Matthew Harrison Brady, played by Frederick March, and the judge is played by Henry Morgan and directed by Stanley Kramer. Oh. If you can pull this movie up, it's an old black and white movie. I recommend it to you, okay? The 1925 trial was a spectacular like America had never seen before. It was broadcast live across the nation, something that had never been done before. The title of the movie comes from the verse in Proverbs 11.29. He who troubles his own house will inherit the wind, and the fool will be servant to the wise of heart. What's interesting about this episode in American history that you aren't familiar with, because it's not, ta it's not talked about, it's not taught in the schools, is that during the trial, it is live courtroom drama that everybody in the United States hears on the radio, okay? And William Jennings Bryan, in the trial, he, um, he brings the other guy up, yeah. uh, Clarence Darrow, and grills him on the witness stand because Clarence Darrow was a pastor also. Oh. And so, in his grilling of him, he talks about things in the Bible to try to discount the Bible because they're trying to promote Darwinism, okay? They're not talking about God created man, they're talking about man was created by accident. Right. <laughs> So, in this grilling, he goes to Genesis 6, and he, and he asks him, who are the sons of God? And what's this all about? And explain it to me. And this pastor, who was a lawyer, can't do it. And this sly lawyer makes him look like a fool in front of the whole nation, because he can't answer the questions here. Okay? The trial was breaking point in then the Christian-based American education of that time. Up until that time, creation by God was the only thing that was taught in American schools. But this trial opened up the floodgates, okay, because it was so much about we need to have an open mind about everything, okay? And it was based on the American education that led to the secular free thinking philosophy that dominates American schools today, and still does. When your kids are going to school and teachers want to discount the Bible, they'll go to Genesis 6 first. There's other places they can go to too. And if we are not wise in what is here, we're not going to be able to answer their questions. And I guarantee you, the college students today that they claim that they are Christians, hmm. and they are dominated in the colleges in America today. These professors know all about Genesis 6. And they will, they will argue with them and try to get them to explain what it is. And because most Christians don't understand this, they can't. And so they look like fools. That's why this is so important. Okay? That monkey trial changed all of the American education from then on up until today, because of Genesis 6. Yes, understanding this biblical knowledge is very important. Evidence will be provided in this teaching, supporting the contention that there is an ongoing 6,000 year conspiracy by Satan's fallen angels, secret societies, and the descendants of Nephilim that is bent on enslaving humankind under the oppressive kingdom of the Antichrist, and that Satan's plan is to inhabit his kingdom here on earth with beings that are half human and half angel. In fact, scripture proves that the Antichrist himself will be a Nephilim. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Now this is after Satan has deceived Eve. 
okay? And Adam and Eve have fallen. And God is making a prophecy to Lucifer, to Satan. This is the first end times prophecy in the Bible. And I will put enmity between you, who? Satan. And the woman, who is the woman? The woman is Mary, the virgin birth of Jesus. And between your seed, whose seed? Satan's seed. The Hebrew word here for seed is Zerah, which means children, offspring, descendants, literally DNA. And her seed, who? Mary's seed. He shall bruise your head. Who's he? Jesus. Who's he going to defeat? Satan. Mm -hmm. And you shall bruise his heel. You are going to cause Jesus to suffer. Mm -hmm. This is the first prophecy in the Bible. And what we see here is that the child that is coming from Mary is going to be Jesus. Mm -hmm. But there's also going to be another child that is born of a fallen angel, Lucifer, and a, a earthly woman. The Antichrist is going to be a nuclear. Okay? Literally. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, Paul calls the Antichrist the son of perdition. Mm -hmm. The son here in the Greek, huos, means male offspring. In other words, the Antichrist will be a Rosemary's baby. Have, did any of you ever see that movie, Rosemary's mm -hmm. Baby? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you didn't see it, don't watch it. <laughs> but it's where it's, it's a movie about a woman an earthly woman that has sex with Satan and creates the Antichrist Okay. Genesis 3.15 is the first prophetic scripture in the Bible it is the beginning of the main narrative for the rest of the Bible hmm. this is what the Bible is all about from now on mm -hmm. the war between Satan's kingdom and God's kingdom. And Satan is going to try to stop this prophecy from happening. Hmm. And he, he starts doing it immediately, and he keeps doing it, and he's doing it today. He's trying to disrupt God's plan. It starts in Genesis 3.15. Satan's plan was to corrupt the bloodline, the DNA of mankind, mm -hmm. so that the Messiah the second Adam, could not be born 100% human to redeem the sins of the first Adam. Thus the Nephilim began producing more and more offspring from humans until after 10 generations after Adam, God saw the bloodline of humans was so corrupted to the point that only Noah and his sons and wives were the only ones that were pure anymore. Mm -hmm. That's why God created the flood. He didn't create the flood because man were evil. He created it because Satan was trying to disrupt the DNA of humankind. Because the Messiah couldn't be born from a bloodline that started with the fallen angels. Mm -hmm. Especially Lucifer. Isn't it interesting? I find it terribly interesting that it's the little things mm -hmm. like the blood. Mm -hmm. like the blood that can make all the difference in the world in the supernatural. Amen? Amen? It's the blood of Jesus that saves us. And Satan knows that. He has been trying to disrupt the bloodline of humankind since Genesis 3. Mm -hmm. And as we go into this study, guys, we're going to see this branching out into all kinds of different areas. And it's going to make so much sense for different things, especially in the bloodlines of the kings of earth. Especially in the bloodlines of the different people that came out after the flood. The descendants of Noah. Mm -hmm. So, God wipes out the human race, except for Noah and his family, undermining Satan's plan. After the flood, the human race is able to start over again clean, and the Nephilim are all gone. Nope. Or are they? Now there's some rabbit trails we must understand before we can continue. <laughs> I know you guys like rabbit trails. <laughs> Fallen angels 
had sex with human women and produced offspring that were half fallen angel and half humans called Nephilim. These Nephilim were mighty men of renown, which is where we get the legends of the supernatural gods in Greek mythology. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yep. These fallen angels also had sex with animals. Oh no, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to get my brain around the other one first. And now you're telling me they had sex with animals too? <laughs> Absolutely. If you go to Jude, chapter 6, and verse chapters in the book of Jude, scriptures, verse 6 and 7, it talks about strange flesh. Okay? This is producing half human, half animal beings, such as centaurs and monsters, like appear in Greek mythology. All of that Greek mythology just wasn't made up. Hmm. It came from reality. This is where we get the images of demons that appear like reptilian monsters. All of that imagery comes from that. Yes? All of these fallen angels are male? Yes. Her question was, are all the fallen angels appearing like males? Yes. yes. Nephilim were giants and dreadful in appearance. There are countless accounts of pictures of human skeletons found around the world, all down through history and up until today. If you go back and look into history of old photographs, when photography was starting to come in, there are pictures of people finding huge skeletons all over the earth, including here in America, that were 10, 12, 15 feet long. Wow. Okay? These are the skeletons of the Nephilim. Science has destroyed most of them down through history because they don't want people to know this. Most of these, there are still a lot of uh, heads of these, and they're elongated. They kind of look like aliens. Mm -hmm. How convenient, okay? If you go to the History Channel, there are several stories about these Nephilim. If you go into history books, old history books that were written 100 years ago, you'll see a lot of this kind of thing talked about. But it isn't talked about anymore. Yes. Um, if, if you look at the Egyptian pharaohs, mm -hmm. especially Akhenaten, mm -hmm. he looks totally like He him. has that elongated head. Yeah. Yes. And it's where the History Channel then tries to bring in the alien thing. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. Th these, these skeletons are real. These skulls are real. Where do they come from? They try to make them into aliens that came to Earth, that started mankind. We're going to get into that <laughs> later on, okay? That's where all of this starts going in so many interesting directions, okay? Nephilims were giants and dreadful in appearance. Nephilim produced in mass before the flood, <clears throat> corrupting the bloodline of mankind, and they were leaders of authority in society pre-flood world, okay? You can imagine if a guy is 12, 15 feet tall, He's probably going to get everybody else to follow him. Oh, yeah, big time. Okay? So they were the kings. They were the leaders. They were the combat leaders, mm -hmm. for sure, in pre-flood earth. Okay? And they multiplied, and they keep multiplying, and they keep corrupting the DNA of humankind until ten generations later, the only ones that aren't corrupted are Noah and his family. That is why God created the flood, to disrupt Satan's plan. You know, Bill, there is a, uh, a belief that Alexander the Great was, his father was mm -hmm. one of those people. We're going to get into that yes. as we get into history and as we go through the Bible. We're going to see how many people that you didn't realize were Nephilim, including today. Yeah, we're going to get into that. When the pre-flood Nephilim died in the flood, their immortal spirits remained destined to haunt the earth in spirit form only. These, Roma, these roaming immortal spirits of bodiless giants are what we know as demons. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we went over this 
many times in Revelation. But let me refresh you. There are fallen angels mm -hmm. that fell with Satan. Mm -hmm. He's one of them. Right. He's the leader of them. They are very powerful. And they have access to heaven and access to all of the heavens mm -hmm. that we saw in the book of Daniel. Right. Daniel's praying and an angel Gabriel comes to tell him a message mm -hmm. and he is stopped by a powerful angel, mm -hmm. the angel of Persia. Mm -hmm. okay, who's up in the sky. He's right. not down on here on right, earth. Right. He can be, but he has access everywhere. So we have fallen angels, but then we have demons. Mm -hmm. Demons are not fallen angels. Right. Fallen angels are not demons. Demons are the spirits of the Nephilim that died in the flood. Mm -hmm. Those creatures that were half fallen angel and half human, when they died, they had a spirit. Mm -hmm. And that spirit is still alive, but it is bound here on earth. The spirits of the creatures, when the fallen angels had sex with animals that created these horrible creatures, mm -hmm. that spirit still stayed too. Mm -hmm. That's why you have these images of demons that look so horrible, like horrible monsters mm -hmm. or reptilian monsters. Because... They take on the form of what they were before the flood. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. Are you believing me? Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you believe I'm telling you the truth? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> okay. Demons are inferior spiritual beings and do not have access to heaven as compared with the most powerful fallen angels. They, along with Satan, the Antichrist and the false, pro false prophet, will be cast into the lake of fire in the last judgment. We saw that at the end of the book of Revelation, okay? So we know what their fate is. And they know what their fate is. Mm -hmm. If you remember the story of Jesus, mm -hmm. when he steps out of the boat, right. and there's that demon-possessed man there, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. who Jesus talks to. Yeah. And they tell him, we are legion, mm -hmm. okay? Because we are many. Right rabbit trail of that is if you're on Facebook all the time and you're seeing these guys that are telling you things about the government mm -hmm. and they act like they're anti-government and yet they're not. They call themselves legion. Wow. Mm -hmm. The same spirits are still calling themselves who they really are. Okay? I'm not even going to mention their name. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. <laughs> okay, so... In Greek mythology, as well as, well, mostly in Greek mythology, the creature Calabos, if you remember mm -hmm. the Clash of the Titans, and he's half reptile and half human. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, is, is, is that where that all came from? Yes. Is that where that yes. whole... All of your Greek of... mythology comes from this teaching. Mm -hmm. Comes from these fallen angels having sex with people and with animals. It's where it comes from. It's real. It was real, and it still is very real, okay? It didn't end back there. Even the Titans were um, Nephilims, right? Yes, yes, because they were giants. Mm -hmm. They were huge, yes. And so all, the movie Transformers, yeah. okay, mm -hmm. where did they get all that imagery? Mm -hmm. Do you think somebody just made that up? Nope. No. No. It comes from Satan because Satan knows his time is short. And he has been working all through history, okay? In the old history, when Satan wanted to convince men of things, his angels would appear to them as gods, mm -hmm. okay? And that convinced men, oh, wow, this is really real. And these guys are gods, mm -hmm. okay? That's your Greek mythology. Today, that wouldn't pass. Right. Today, they appear to men as aliens, mm -hmm. okay? We're from another planet. We were here, we seeded mankind many, many echoes ago, and we're coming back someday, da-da-da-da, okay? We're going to get into that when we get into the UFO thing. Any questions? Do you like this teaching? Hmm. Amen. Is it interesting? Yeah. Okay, we're going to go a little bit more. Nimrod. Mm -hmm. Let's go to this character named Nimrod in Genesis 10, and we're going to start with verse 8. Genesis 
10, verse 8. Cush begot Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one on earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. What is so important about Nimrod? Quite simply, Nimrod was the most influential and infamous evil individu individual in ancient history. And his historic ripples are felt today. Nimrod built the Tower of Babel. We see that in chapter 11, verse 1 through 4. The beginning of the Babylonian Empire and culture that would be the enemy of God's people all down through history. We studied this in the book of Daniel. Nimrod started the ancient mystery religions that ran counter to God's divine plan for mankind. Freemasonry, the Illuminati, the occult, and all false religions were birthed out of the workings of Nimrod and his wife, Simiramis. We've studied this many times. When it says, mighty hunter before the Lord, the word there is Gibrion, which means mighty, unusually powerful giant, men of renown. Gibrion is the word giants, back in Genesis 6-4, that is clearly talking about Nephilim. Mm. Nimrod was an enemy before God. He was an evil king, a conqueror of both men and animals, a giant of a man, and he was a Nephilim. This is after the flood. Hmm. Nimrod desired a one world government. He was bent on heresy and the Antichrist doctrines. Nimrod was the king of the post flood Nephilim race and the high priest of the religion of the fallen angels. Oh. Okay? We have a religion that we're talking about now of the fallen angels, which is the religion of Satan's kingdom here on earth. Now, the Masons trace their beginnings to the stone masters that constructed the Tower of Babel wow. and other great cities that Nimrod built. We see that in Genesis 10, 11. According to Masonic, Masonic legend, Nimrod was the first Grand Master. That's the head guy in Freemasonry. Babel was the symbolic statement toward heaven. It was erected not only to honor false gods, but to memorialize man's active defiance and rebellion against God of the universe who had sent the flood. The mystical secrets, the seven sacred sciences that were given to the Nephilim by the fallen angels, are part of the illumination that has been the building blocks for modern mysticism. Okay. That's why people in the Illuminati are called the Illuminati. They have been illuminated to secrets that are not known to mm -hmm. most of mankind. That's the thought there. Examples of these secrets in modern mystic sciences are ge geometry and alchemy, mm -hmm. which is really banking. Alchemy is the old secret science of creating gold out of nothing, okay? The, the mystic priests of Babylon started this, and then it transferred to Egypt. So when Moses comes before Pharaoh, and those priests that are around Pharaoh, they turn their staffs into snakes. Right, right, right. That really happened. Yeah. Okay? They were able to do that. And then Moses turned, lets his rod go down, and his rod turns into a bigger snake, and eats all of them, right. okay? But so many times in the Bible, we see stories like this, and we go, did that really happen? Did those priests really have the power yeah. to do that? Yes, they did. It was given to them by Satan, of course. Alchemy was part of their deceiving of the kings then. They claimed that they could take rocks or coal or something that wasn't worth anything and turn it into gold. Mm -hmm. And they would do trickery to do that. That was old alchemy. It was part of the old secrets that the fallen angels had given to these 
high priests in Satan's kingdom, in the mystic religions. Today, we see the same thing happening. You look at the Federal Reserve, mm. they take nothing and turn it into money. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. They just keep printing more money. Right. <laughs> and they want your money, and you give them your money, and they charge you to keep it. Right. And they're making money out of nothing. <laughs> okay? That's where it all comes from. The followers of Nimrod, the Chaldeans, were renowned as wise men, and they are the sorcerers the prophet Daniel contends with in Babylon. Mm -hmm. Remember, Daniel's always getting in trouble with the Chaldeans. Mm -hmm. Okay, They're trying to get him into trouble. They're the ones that get him into trouble for praying and he gets thrown into the lion's den. Right. The founding Masonic organizations at Babel became known as the Ultra Secret Great White Brotherhood, which is another name for the modern day Illuminati. Mm -hmm. We're going to get into that more as we go further into history. Babel translated from the oldest languages means gateway to the gods. The Tower of Babel was the post flood area where the fallen angels came down once more and descended to earth to take daughters of men and create more Nephilim. Hmm. These new Nephilim bloodlines would lead Satan's continuous battle once again to destroy the divine plans of God for the salvation of mankind. It's what Satan has been trying to do all along. These terrible giant warriors would be the backbone of the armies of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Anakites, the Amalekites, and the Philistines that Satan would specifically plant in the land that God had promised to the nation of destiny, Israel. Okay? Why did God tell the Israelites, you have to destroy those people that are in that land? Mm -hmm. Utterly. Exactly. You have to destroy them all. Yep. Don't leave any of them alive. Okay. Kill their women, their children, their animals, okay. everything. Well, why the animals? Well, you know why the animals. Yeah. Okay? Why the people? Because they were corrupt. Bloodline. Their bloodlines were corrupt. Satan is starting to do what he did back before the flood. Yeah. And that's why God commanded them to kill all of those people. Mm -hmm. God still wants those people killed because they are not saved. Right. They cannot be saved. Right. Okay? This is part of an understanding that is so fuzzy and so misunderstood with Christians today that we're going to get into later. I keep telling you we're going to get into these mm -hmm. things because we're going to hit each one of them specifically and go deeper into them as we go along. Okay? I think I'm going to stop here for tonight.